happy Tuesday or Wednesday, depending on where you are in the world. I uh, hope everybody had a, a great week, and um, I'm loaded with more questions. So, uh, you know, if you've been listening, you, you know, I've got this thing about volume, and uh, it's important. But for the average surfer, it's really just a uh, base, a base reference. It's not what you get on the so-called volume checkers is not gospel. It's just it gives you. And what you should do is you should look at the volume. And this question here says volume is today a major thing. What increments should a regular guy do? Half a liter or one liter? I would definitely say no to half a liter. You know, as I've pointed out many times, I, you know, half a liter is a coffee cup, roughly. Uh, a liter, yes. And depending on how, it's a, the volume thing is, is, a, is a percentage of your body weight. You convert your body weight to kilograms and you take roughly a third of uh, your body weight. And um, But the bigger the board is, that's going to mean more volume. Like a short board might be, might be a liter. You know, in a seven foot board, it might be two liters. An eight foot board, it might be three liters. But uh, the volume thing, once again, is just, it's one, uh, it's just one parameter of board design. I, I you, you wouldn't believe how many customers I get that are adamant about a half a liter. And they go, well, what if I ha add a half an inch? If you add a half an inch, it adds about three tenths or two tenths of a liter. Um, Probably, you know, there's there's so many different aspects to the design of the surfboard. And I could spend hours and hours talking about it. Um, I think one of the most commonly looked, you know, overlooked uh, design aspects is is the, the overall width of the board. And then, you know, specific widths, like the tail. Like I forever have kept records of the width of a tail an inch up, six inches up, 12 inches up, 18 inches up. And I get somebody squabbling with me over a third of a liter, but they have no, they haven't made a single comment about the width, much less the rocker, the thickness, the balance of the thickness and the balance of the template, much less the rails. Um, you know, there's just the common milk toast rail out these days with a kind of a higher apex and a rounder rail. And I, you know, if you, if you uh, let me just design what I want, I would probably have a little bit lower apex than most of my rails. And, um, but yeah, back to the volume question, it's just, yeah. Please don't, please don't get too hung up on it, you know, unless you're an, you're an advanced surfer and you're a lighter surfer, a liter, you know, a liter either way, you know, 25 and a half liters, you'll, you'll probably feel, you might feel a half a liter, uh, but then when you get up to like 30 liters, you're, I've got pros that were adamant about 29.5 and then now they're at 30. And then their next board, they want 31 or 32. Um, How do you ask it to do that? Oh. You're being covered by the comments. Oh. Uh, but yeah, keep in mind that it's really a, a kind of a relative percentage uh, thing. Um, uh, what, <laughs> what tips do you have for what you give to people when ordering a board? Uh, <laughs> I, 
I have advanced surfers that have been riding my boards for 20 or 30 years, and they go, they email me, and they go, if you're not too busy, can you make me another 6'2", just like the last one? And I go, no problem. And then I get guys that are beginners that send me a five-page introduction letter telling me about how they surf, where they surf, what they've ridden, and, you know, it, it turns out that they... You know, there's nothing wrong with it. it. You know, it depends on your situation. But you know, they, they only get to surf a few times a year, and but they're, you know, they're what they're internet educated. Um, <clears throat> what advice would I give, or what tips? I would, uh, I would tend to be. I would say, you know, please be a little bit more flexible. Uh, I had a guy up in Newport, he was the older guy, and he had a, um, a top brand board, and he wanted but he wanted me to copy it. And we, uh, Pedro, Pedro, Pedro measured it up for me, he took a tail template, and we built the board. And I thought it came out insane, but he got the board, and he was livid. I go, what's the problem? He goes, the tail template's off. And I go, I mean, it's off. He goes, it's not the same one I wanted. I go, we took a tail template. And he, he, you know, he didn't mention that the rock, there was more rocker or more concave or less concave, or, you know, anything like that. He was like, the jail template's off. <laughs> I, I said, please try the board. I, I have tried, you know, in my lifetime, I've tried so many different... Um, Sorry, I need to... Yeah, it is asking you to go. Oh, oh, is it being here, covered by the... Here, just I'll take the thing away, I guess. By the... Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, trust your shaper. You know, if you, if you, you know, especially if you choose an experienced shaper. I mean, there's some young shapers that are pretty good. But... Um, uh, you know, as time goes by, shapers get more experienced, and uh, some shapers choose to broaden their scope. Others kind of are fixated on one thing. But uh, you know, after you've decided to to go the particular brand, you should you should trust the shaper. You should give them some leeway, some uh, creative juices. And um, I get people that. Uh, I had a, a person yesterday that wanted to order a tea dwart, and um, we, we actually, I don't think we have it anymore on our list of boards, uh, but I said, look, I can, I can recreate the tea dwart. I, you just tell me, you give me a rough idea of w what you want, and I can, I can recreate it. I can recreate, I can combine a piranha and a, and a tea dwart, and you know, I can, do a triple wing Neil Diamond, or, but that you know that's the beauty of custom shaping is you can you you can design and you can have boards built, but on the flip side, you know, listen listen to your shaper. I had I had another guy, uh, Texas, a lot of good surfers in Texas, you know, um, and he's. You know, he's emailed me a long email, <clears throat> and he, I, so I sent him a design I thought would be good for him, and he sent me another long email, and, I, and he said, can we talk? And so, yeah, sure, the next the next day I gave him a call, and he, he talked my ear off for 45 minutes, and I thought we agreed on a board, and... Uh, so I programmed it and I sent him to sent it to him for approval, and he goes, "Well, we need to talk again." <laughs> and uh, I emailed him back a very polite email. That's look, we've spent quite a bit of time on this. You have to, you know, if I was a lawyer, your bill would be thousands of dollars, but. Um, you have to respect the shaper's time as well when you're ordering a board. Kind of figure it out and get to know, you know, all the different designs are available and figure it out. But this guy, he said, well, I, I need to talk again. And 
I sent him. Could you go get my power cord? You the next to the bed? My power cord. Oh, yeah. thanks. Um, so I sent him, yeah, I sent him a very polite email. And I said, you know, look, Clay, uh, you know, I, I really want to make you what's best for you. I've been listening. I've been, you know, I sent you several designs, but please, you know, have some respect for my my time. And, you know, we're going on three or four hours of talking. <laughs> and the next day I get an email back. He says, cancel my order. And I'm going, oh. So I guess I'm kind of mumbling on, but, um, you know, I usually communicate through email. Uh, you know, time to time I'll get on the phone with somebody, but, um, yeah, it's, that's a, that's another tip when you're ordering a board. Shapers, most shapers, you know, want to communicate with you one way or the other. You know, if you're a busy shaper, preferably email, but, um, yeah, have have a little bit of respect for the shaper's time because, uh, you know, hand shaping a board takes a short board takes I don't know an hour, hour and a half depending on uh, how complicated the board is, and you know you spend maybe twenty minutes or half an hour talking with a customer either via email or on the phone, and there's about a two hour you know that's about a two hour time commitment to to the board. But when somebody starts taking three, four, five hours of your time and they go back and forth, and I had another customer the other day that I'd sent him about five different designs, and he goes, well, I think, you're, I, think I like your first design the most. <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> I said, all right, <laughs> we'll go with the first design. But enough of that. Um, what are the basics for rocker? Um, that is a very, 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 very good question. Um, back in the old days, the boards were basically planks. Cause, uh, that's what um, uh, you know. People thought they needed big, giant, long, wide, flat boards. And as excuse me, as time. As time uh, went by, the board started getting smaller and narrower, more curve in the outline and more curve in the bottom. And uh, it was really, I think, in 67 when uh, boards started to uh, started to get shorter. And, um, you know, and I've said this before, April 68, I, I was tripping because in the magazines, there were ads for long boards from the big companies. And then there were ads from other, a few other big companies and some, some smaller companies that could afford to advertise mm -hmm. um, on short boards, you know, this, six, eight, seven twos, you know, and the, the other guys are still trying to pedal, uh, you know, nine sixes. And that's really when people really started experimenting with rocker and, uh, not so much tail rocker, but nose rocker. And uh, you can see if you have access somehow to these old magazines, maybe online, you can see how radical uh, uh, some of the designs were. Uh, uh, Reno Abelera did a collaboration with GNS in the late 60s, um, uh, a board called The Disc which basically looked like a snow ski. It, it had such exaggerated nose rocker. Um, it, I, I personally don't know how it rode, and I never saw anybody ride one except Reno. But, um, you know, as time marched on in, into the mid-70s and the later in the 70s, uh, uh, tail rocker started to become uh, more closely looked at, and... People started experimenting with um, more, more and more tail rocker, and uh, you know, fast forward, you know, into the '80s, um, I, I started using more tail rocker. I was a little bit hesitant on the entry rocker, uh, just because I thought that it was starting to become excessive. And then in the late '80s, uh, when Kelly, uh, I think is 
I'm guessing at the dimensions, but the board is like six two and eighteen and a quarter inches wide and two and a quarter inches thick. But it had like six inches of nose rocker and uh, two and a half inches, of two and five eighths inches tail rocker, and it it looked like a banana. But Kelly is such a freak that he 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 won contests. He won a lot of contests. Uh, and everybody followed the followed the leader. And I remember making a board for Taylor Knox. It was, you know, Taylor's this pretty solid guy. He's 175, 80 pounds, I think. And he started he started you know glomming onto Kelly's ideas. And he had me make a board uh, 17 and three quarters inches wide, but it also had banana rocker. And he wrote it in the OP contest. And he looked great when he was right in the pocket. The board looked super loose and free, but the minute it came out of the pocket, the board bogged. And um, so, you know, fast forward in the 2000s, I, uh, Pat O'Connell asked me to recreate the, uh, a board that I made him for Five Summer Stories. And, um, and I, I remember it had a lot of rocker, but I went back and I looked at it. It was like a five, nine, and it had, it had five and three quarters inches of nose rocker and two and a half inches of tail rocker. I, I call him up and I said, Pat, I can, I can duplicate this board. Uh, you know, I can special order blank with all the extra rocker glue up and or I can modify it slightly to, more, more towards modern standards. And so we backed the rocker down a little bit, but um, I'd say these days, uh, the rocker on the boards is, you know, especially in the era of the machines, uh, doesn't fluctuate. The tail doesn't fluctuate much. I mean, if you look at the average 6.0 or 6.2, um, I would bet that 90% of them, two and an eighth, maybe give or take an eighth of an inch or th three sixteenths. And um, the nose rocker varies a little bit more from shaper to shaper. And uh, so what rocker does basically is it is designed to fit the curve of the wave or the path that you want to take on the wave. Uh, more rockers, more curve, it'll have, there's always a trade-off on a design aspect. It'll have theoretically less drive, but uh, tighter arcs and the flatter the rocker gets, it'll have more drive, it'll have longer arcs, and that's what fishes are all about. You know, the performance short boards are the ones that have the tighter arcs, more rocker, and, you know, the type of boards the guys compete on. Um, so, and then there's everything in between, uh, which, you know, when I say a fish, a five, uh, a five, six fish might have an inch and three quarters tail rocker, and a five, six short board might have maybe an extra eighth of an inch tail rocker or three sixteenths, but the nose rocker is a huge difference. So, um, yeah, when you're custom ordering a board, whether it's me or anybody else, you know, uh, maybe I'm giving you guys too much ammunition, but, uh, you know, it, you can look at our boards online. You can look at a lot of boards online and, most people use the word, you know, a lot or mellow or moderate, and those are kind of vague terms. But um, um, I would encourage you to look at other components on a, on a surfboard. Uh, volume, you really don't know. There's probably a 5% variance on what the machine cuts and what the finished product has. And that's a lot more than a half a liter of um, volume uh, and then there's the finish work it's it's how much sanding the shaper does and how much foam he takes off I swear a, a third of a liter is like uh, just sand, you know sanding an extra couple of strokes all over the whole board and that'll take off a third of a liter um, so uh, yeah you know if you're really if you're if you're serious about your surfing and you're surfing a lot and you're trying lots of boards which I encourage everybody to do um, don't focus so much on leaderage 
you know, it's it's a consideration. But uh, you know, somebody asked me, well, I, you know, geez, I've never ridden a board. Un, you know, I ride it usually nineteen and an eighth, nineteen and a quarter, but I've never ridden a board under nineteen because I, had, you know, he only weighed one hundred and forty pounds or something like that. So I programmed the board like eighteen and three quarters for him, and you know, in terms of volume. It's really not that much less volume, but in terms of surface area and planing area, and the distance from rail to rail, and the quickness of time from, you know, rolling from rail to rail or turning from rail to rail, is much quicker. It's more. It's much more sensitive, and um, you know that's another issue that you should uh, not issue, but that's another factor that you should take in. Um, so trying to keep it under four hours, but. Uh, you know, having questions about all of those things, is, it might be difficult, but uh, in all seriousness, um, you know, somebody that's, you know, got 500 or 1,000 boards under their belt uh, can arguably make a good board for, you know, almost everybody because the, uh, you know, the skill level is like a pyramid and at the, bottom, at the bottom, like I was at one time, uh, Surfers are, are beginners, and then a beginner intermediates, and then the, as as you get better and better, um, the number of surfers that, that are at your skill level uh, starts to uh, diminish. And but most most of the better surfers that have been around for a while and tried a lot of boards have a much better idea besides volume of what they uh, want in their boards. Uh, length versus width. What is the best direction? A wider board or a longer board? Um, it's really a uh, it's really a broad scope question. Um, you know, I think if, I think if you're a beginner, uh, length and width are going to be your friends. Uh, as you advance, it's all it's all in how you want to surf. Um, there's some great surfers that ride nine foot boards that are 23 inches wide and three inches thick. Um, great surfers. Um, the great surfers that ride boards that are 18 inches wide and two and an eighth thick and are 510. So that's really more of a, a philosophical question. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I encourage people to, over time, you know, get a quiver going. Just don't be a one board at a guy time. Uh, you know, you get your go-to board when you're beginning, and then, you know, probably that board's big enough to keep for the really small days as you advance, and then as you advance, you get a more high-performance board if that's the direction you want to go. And then the next board you should probably get is a step-up board, if you're, especially if you're interested in riding bigger waves. And build, you know, start to build your quiver. And if you can afford it, you, you know, hang on to the good ones and ride them from time to time. Uh, you want to check some more wine? Some uh, online questions. Uh, Finn can't preference. For a quad. For a quad short board. Um, the front, you know, if, what is the fin camp preference for a quad shortboard? And, uh, the front fins, I usually have a, roughly the same angle. It's, if you're measuring the flat of a board, you know, if you, if you create a flat surface, because most boards these days don't have flat surfaces, but if you create an imaginary flat surface, the fin would be canted out about seven eighths of an inch um, uh, from the trailing the trailing bottom point to the trailing top point and the the rear fins are about half as much uh, their front fins four and a half inches on average and the rear fins are four give or take a little bit on average and they're a little bit closer in from the rail that's my theory um, and they're a little bit straighter up and down, and they're, but they're pointed at the same point that the main fins are. Um, but I, 
years and years ago, I was working with Wayne Lynch, and um, <laughs> I said, well, what are your thoughts on Finn, Finn Cant? And, you know, Wayne, w Wayne was one of my very first heroes. Um, as soon as this board started getting shorter, there was this crazy footage of this 16-year-old uh, in a movie called Evolution, 16, 17-year-old from uh, Victoria, Australia. That it, it was surfing was mind blowing. But years later, I got uh, you know I got the opportunity to work with him for a while, and I asked him, and he and he, he kind of looked at me straight in the eye, and he, he goes, "Well, seven eighths of an inch," and that's the um, that's the net difference. I failed on that earlier, but that's the difference between. The, the rear, the trailing tips of the two fins and the uh, trailing uh, base point on the two fins. So slightly less than half an inch. Um, but yeah, he looked at me and said, oh, seven eighths of an inch. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> but the, the straighter up and down a fin is the, um, you know, thought, the thinking is it's going to have more drive. And the more cantoned out the fin is, the easier it will roll from rail to rail, but it will have less drive. And, um, you know, boards, uh, uh, some of the twin fins in the late 70s, and certainly with some of the early tri fins, uh, the, some of the fins were really canted out. And you can see the guys weren't getting the distance out of the turns. And, you know, they were doing, they're, they're Tightening up their arcs, but they were make, weren't making a lot of ways they could have made. Um, so uh, that's what how the cant affects performance, in basic terms. And uh, I think I think once again most shapers are kind of on the same page with you know, very slight variations. The same thing with templates too. There's so many. Uh, surfer or shaper uh, model templates out there and these days most of them are, are pretty good but they're all pretty similar and uh, uh, you know there's there's the fin cant there's the area there's the rake there's the flex there's a whole book that could be written about fins um, I don't know if they still have it, but Surfline, I did a series of design articles for them a few years ago, and uh, one of them was on fins. And I, you know, I wrote about an eight-page eight article on all those different aspects I just mentioned. Um, did you change something on the SD model after Dana Reynolds used it in Stab in the Dark? Uh, not, not really. Uh, it's got one of the deeper single concaves that uh, we offer, uh, you know, close to 0.3 inches. And I've talked about this before. I consider uh, shallow 0.1, you know, whether it's a convex or a concave and intermediate 0.2 and... Uh, and deep, you know, anything over about 0.25 or 2.8. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't really change much. You know, he he had Dane. I think he kind of liked the board because he surfed really well on it. I mean, he had one of the stronger segments on my board, and uh, you, you know, he's looking at it and he's kind of trying to figure out something to say about it. He goes, well, the tail template's kind of funky. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I looked at it, and it, yeah, it was. It was a little bit more of a rounded rounded squash than a squash tail. Uh, and, uh, you know, in hindsight, I think he, uh, I don't know how, how what his thoughts were these days on tails, but it, at that time he was riding a lot of uh, pretty wide tail block uh, square tails. But um, no, the the rocker and the concave in the bottom and the template proportions are all the same. I may have taken a slight a slight bit of the uh, the hip wing. Uh, I, I might have mellowed it out a touch, and I might have made it, the tail 
a little bit more squashy. But then I get I get people that ask me for round tail SDs and they look they look cool. So once again, that's the beauty of a custom. Somebody you go on the website and say, I like the look of the SD, but I really like the feel of a round tail. And I go, no problem. It takes me two minutes. Uh, so um, yeah, it's still pretty much the same. And it, I mean, that goes back to the yes thanks, that, which is, I don't know, is it 15 years old now, Pedro? No, it's about that, yeah. Uh, the yes thanks is, is pretty much the same bottom as the SD. It's just got, uh, the yes thanks got a little bit narrower nose, wide point back, just a fraction. And, um, but if you look at the profiles of the boards, the SD has a touch more nose rocker, but the SD is still, I think, I mean, the Yes Thanks is a, uh, still a legitimate performance shortboard. Um, favorite, favorite planer? Well, once upon a time, there was draw knives. <laughs> and they poo-pooed. They poo pooed electric planers. <laughs> the real craftsmen. <laughs> oh, those things. Uh, they use draw knives, you know, two handled <laughs> woodworking tools. Uh, you know, when I first started shaping in six to the. Is it the. Um, I, can never, I can't even remember anymore, but it's like. <laughs> I shaped my first board in the fall of 69. The, the elect, electric skill 100s were the go-to planer. And there's all kinds of planers. There's bigger, heavier, more powerful planers. There's lighter planers for hobbyists. You know, and planers are designed for planing wood. Uh, and then surfers got a hold of them and started shaping surfboards with them. But... Uh, Skills stopped making the uh, their planers oh, twenty five years ago, maybe. I'm guessing twenty five thirty years ago, and I, I freaked out. I, I I had one backup planer, and you could still buy parts, but then I started hoarding planers. I I had, I had twelve, fifteen skill planers. And uh, the, they, they came in a variety of amperage, and the higher the amps, the more powerful the motor, and those were the ones that I preferred. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've got at least a dozen skill planers. Clark Foam uh, you know, realized that once skill stopped making the planers, that somebody had to step up and uh, do something about the planers for surfboards. So Hitachi made a planer that was lighter, but a higher RPM uh, planer. And uh, some shapers were already using it, and some shapers were modifying it. So what Clark Foam did is they, uh, you know, questioned a bunch of shapers and and got suggestions on what to do with the planer. And Clark Foam actually sold. Uh, it was a Hitachi. Um, it was a plastic body, which is, I don't know, I kind of like the aluminum bodies and the skill planers, but a uh, plastic body. So it was lighter, it was easier on the shaper's back. It, you know, had a faster RPM, so it didn't tear as less. And that, you know, uh, that probably, I think, became the most popular planer after the skill. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of a go-to planer these days. So... Uh, but yeah, I've got a lot of great memories about uh, hoarding my, my skills. Uh, I went out an hour inland once, so the, the guy was advertising a planer, and he's like an old ex-farmer dude. And he goes, I have no idea what this thing's worth. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him it was priceless, but you know, I paid him, I don't know, 300 bucks for the thing, which is, you knew a skill planer was back in the day it was maybe 120 bucks or something like that but now you know people are getting over a thousand bucks for them um <clears throat> uh, 
do wings on the outline do? That's a good question. Um, you know, there's a few shapers in the 50s that experimented with bumps in the outline. And uh, that was good thinking, especially for those bigger, heavier boards, because what it does is it, it breaks out, up the outline curve and it gives you a, a pivot point, uh, you know, in basic words. And uh, uh, Velzy, I think, did one called the bump. Uh, and but wings, I think wings really started to become popular uh, in the very early '70s. And I think you know then by then a lot of shapers were experimenting with them. But one you know one that I can really remember is uh, Terry Fitzgerald. Um, but uh, wings have become a very commonplace uh, design feature. And I, I mean, my personal thought on wings are you, you know, with a trifin, uh, I don't know, I kind of prefer a bump, a little, a little bump in the out, a little break in the outline. And I've experimented with, you know, moving them up and down the board and, uh, you know, if you move them up too far and you have too much of a break, the board really doesn't want to commit to a line. It kind of tries to set a rail, but it's hard because you know, there's too much break in the outline. Um, probably, well, one of the most important designs to me was the uh, Piranha. And uh, I got to give a shout out to Timmy Patterson who was making Chris Ward's boards at the time, 20 years ago, or whatever. And, you know, I was still going over to Hawaii every winter and judge, well, I stopped judging, but I was shaping every winter. And I was sitting on the beach, just, you know, it was a four foot day at back door. And Chris Ward was out. He was, he looked like he was riding almost like a fish, but he was lighting the place up. And I watched, and when he came in, I go, hey, can I check out your board? And he goes, sure. And, and it, it, had, it was kind of a fuller outline, uh, maybe, a, you know, another inch on the nose, and, uh, and a kind of a fuller tail, but it had th three sets of wings and a swallow tail. <laughs> I just go, wow. And, and back, you know, around 1970, give or take a couple of years, Michael Peterson uh, you know, he was experimenting a lot with wings. As I said, probably a lot of shapers were, but Michael Peterson, I remember seeing a photo of him with six sets of wings or something. I don't think it really caught on. Uh, it, well, it didn't catch on. It's too freaking hard to build. But um, I don't know. Wings are, you know, for twin fins, I think they're super critical. Because um, the, the way I design a twin fin is I have the... You know the curve through the middle, and as it runs in towards the wing, I have it, I have it actually straighten out a little bit as it comes into the wing, and my thinking is for a little bit more drive. And then I have a an angular wing, roughly half inch, and then the the line breaks, but not too much. I I, I see a lot of shapers to the, this day that, uh, well, I don't even know if you call them twin fins because they all have three boxes, but. Uh, to be a twin fin, it's got two fins and that's it. But uh, the hard wing uh, is lined up with the pretty much the rear rear of the fin. And I, you know, short boards, I, I place my fins at eight and a half, nine inches and an uh, inch and a half in from the rail, inch and three eighths. And, and then there's a wing, a hard wing, uh, which the lines up with the rear of the fin and then there's a break and but it's not a noticeable it's it's still kind of keeps with the line of the main template and then i have a, I usually have a, a a concave that runs out through that wing 
And that's all, all of those things are designed to give the board, you know, you put it over a rail and it holds. And then when you start to come out of your turn, it releases off the wing and it, your line breaks and you come up the face quicker and, or, you know, cut back, you know, you have a noticeable uh, break point in your turns. And, um, you know, too big of a wing. I, you know, once again, Design is is about happy mediums. It's like, well, what if you had a two inch big wing? And I go, well, you, you know, imagine it, it, you'd probably it, you really wouldn't feel like there was a tail on the board behind the wing if you know if you had too much of a break or if you didn't have enough of a break, you really wouldn't feel it at all. So um, that's you know, design work is. Um, Finding a balance. Finding a balance. Uh, what is the what is the function of grab rails? Uh, my first experience with grab rails is when uh, uh, we started. Well, we we I we I take that back. We had, we had done them in the '90s, and we had experimented with glass rope. Uh, uh, rovings along the rails and we'd create dents and put the rovings in and um, and that would help uh, it would help the boards uh, keep from breaking but that was a little bit different than the grab rails the grab rails uh, I you know stretch I'm not sure if he's the the pioneer but he's been the main he's been a big advocate of them and I think that uh, it you know, I get guys ordering them because, the, it, one, it helps them duck dive. It helps them push up on the board. Um, you know, on a short board, uh, it it will arguably stiffen up the board a little bit, like a corrugated tin roof. If you have a flat tin roof, it'll be all floppy and everything. But if you have the one, you know, the tin roofs with uh, ridges on it. Uh, it's much, much sturdier, and uh, so that's that's you know its strength. It's um, helps some people duck dive and push up, and uh, we we uh, you know we do string we do a few stringless boards, and uh, I tend to put more rail grabs on those boards than uh, I do boards with. You know, the heavier the stringer, the stiffer the board's going to be. And I have a couple of um, uh, Jamie Sterling, uh, Garrett McNamara, a couple of guys that uh, are all about grab rails, especially Jamie. And uh, um, JoJo's been experimenting with some lately. And uh, that's on their big guns because those things are three and three quarters inches thick, sometimes as much as four or four and a quarter thick, and it's just hard to get your hands around the rails. And it's not really so much for strength on the big boards because they usually are glassed a lot heavier, have a much bigger wood down the center. But um, yeah, the guns, uh, a lot of the, you know, not a lot, but quite a few of the guns get them. Uh, what else have we got? This is a question from a guy online, just... Ah, talk about how low apex down rails on a flat deck work to gain volume, but still provide a high, high performance rail. Um, First off, the apex is the widest point of the board, uh, and how you that is usually depending on the shape, or maybe between you know 0 0.55, 0 0.65, 0 0.75, maybe as much as 0.8 or 0 0.9. The distance that apex is up from the the you know up from the bottom of the rail. Um, I. Uh, when in the early '80s, when um, I started making tri fins, uh, you know, in the, in the '70s, I had I had fairly low apex rails, and I had pretty 
uh, pretty full rails, but um, not as angular as like as they made them later. But the decks were pretty flat, and the rails were pretty full, and the apex was lower, and they were great. Um, the lower apex rails set quicker. Um, you just you have to be careful about how much volume you have after the apex and coming up into the deck. Uh, if you have too much volume, the rail, you'll have a harder time setting the rail. Um, the board will be less sensitive. And if you take too much out, the board will overcommit because you have, you know, that's the thing with a, with a you know, a convex deck is, and you have a rounded rail, it, it um, it'll, you can, you can drive the rail pretty darn deep in the water and bring it out. Um, but with a lower apex rail and an angular rail, and it's a good question about the volume, because at all of our uh, flat deck models, um, I generally go about 0.2, almost a quarter of an inch thinner to get the same volume. And uh, I, I get people, I get some Japanese customers occasionally that are interested in a flat deck board and they want to order them, you know, 2.35 or 2.4 thick like they would their normal short board. And you know, this is not Japanese, it's, you know, customers. Um, uh, but I have to remind them that if, you know, if they do normally ride like two and three eighths, uh, two and seven sixteenths, that they're probably going to need to get a board roughly a quarter inch thinner on the flat deck boards. So yeah, they have more volume at the top. They have less in the middle and they have a lower apex. And it, you know, if the rails design right, it, you, you'll be surprised because when you tip the board over, it will engage a lot quicker than a typical round reel crown deck setup and it will engage and then when you when you start to release your turn it will disengage or uh, it'll come out of the water quicker uh, i don't know i'm a big advocate of them but uh, uh, and like i said if they made right they, uh, the ride's beautiful. You know, they get up in the water and they plane quicker too. The lower the apex. Somebody said uh, once, uh, asked me once, they go, "Well, how? What about Morris Cole's designs with the hard edge all the way around the board? Um, you know, the edges. Uh, the edges vary. You know, usually they're a little bit firmer in the nose. They, the apex gets to its highest point." around the wide point or just ahead of the wide point and then it, it tails off and then the last 18 inches there's hardly at least on my boards there's hardly any tuck and uh josh curry used to say yeah i want my edge to start you know four fingers in front of the front fin and uh you know wade a little touch further back and he's real particular about the how tucked under the edge is and but that's that's good because you're focusing on the business the business end of the surfboard. You know the last last third of the you know if you have to assign importance to well what's the most important part of a board and I think it's what I call the business end and that's behind the wide point. Um, <clears throat> uh, what else? Uh, what's the fun? We've only got eight minutes. Yeah, I got I, I only have a couple minutes left, so I'm yeah. trying to. Uh, what? What? What are the basic for fins? What to try? What fins to change the board? Guidance for regular civilians. That is actually a very good question. Fins. I, uh, you know, once upon a time we all had glass ons, and then. Uh, you know, in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, GNS came out with a removable fin for all the twin fins they were making. And, uh, uh, you know, and then FCS came along. And when FCS came along, that really changed, uh, that really changed the landscape on fins. And the uh, first FCF fins, were shitty. 
I, I know how else to put up and they're shitty. And none of the pros wrote them because they were shitty. The, the problem was, it wasn't so much the templates, the foils were, you know, but it was the material they're made out of. They're made out of a plastic. And, a, you know, I call it the memory in the fin, but it's how quick uh, the fin goes back to its original state. And um, I was obsessed with fins my whole life. Um, you know, since I started surfing and shaping, I, I mentioned I used to hang out with Skip a little bit. And he used to have a, a crate in the back of his car and truck or whatever of 10, 15 different fins. And I go, wow. And he goes, yeah, everyone makes the board ride different. And there's a lot of truth to that. And if you can imagine having three or four fins, it really makes a difference. But, you know, FCS... Uh, uh, you know, we all the pro surfers kept getting glass ons, and there was a interesting, uh, interesting interview with uh, it was Dan and Surfers. It was the, the interview was called the movie was called Surfers, and there was uh, you know they interviewed all the surfers about you know fins, uh, different aspects of the boards, and different aspects about surfing and. So they asked them about fins, and about 10, 10 of them always said, well, glass-ons, because they're so much better. And I, I th I'm not sure, but I think it was Dane Reynolds. Maybe he was kind of new on the scene, and they asked him, and he goes, he thinks about it, and he says, oh, I like glass-ons, but heck, Kelly Sater rides FCS plastic. You know, you, Kelly rides FCS, so it must be good. <laughs> but FCS did come along. Uh, you know, after uh, Futures uh, came onto the scene and started experimenting with a lot uh, better molding materials, a lot more sophisticated molding. And I think FCS saw the writing on the wall, too. They were already experimenting with it. So they started uh, doing, you know, you know, carbon, high-density foam, and different placements of carbon, and uh, really good foils, and, and uh, the flex patterns are pretty good. I, some, you know, some of the fin designs have a softer flex pattern, and some have a stiffer flex pattern. Uh, and that, you know, one of my problems with the, with the plastic fins is they had a very slow uh, rebound. Whereas you have a fin that's made out of G10 or you know carbon and fiberglass, it's going to have a very quick rebound. You put pressure on it, and as you ease up, it springs, but it is much quicker and more alive. Um, so, uh, and then th that's the material that fins are made out of. It's, <coughs> and I'll I'll pick up on this next time. But uh, there's the overall uh, area of the fin. Um, and I, I, I tell, you know, I, uh, I almost made a t-shirt once that said, friends don't let friends ride plastic fins. If they come with a surfboard and you get the surfboard, take them, set them aside. So if you sell the surfboard, you can sell the fins with the board or include the fins. But you really, I think it's an essential, uh, part of a perform any kind of performance board is uh is a composite is a composite fin and uh next time i'll get into the, you know the rake the area thickness the foil there's so much to cover but uh anyways um all of you tuning in have a great week and uh I we might get Jojo here next Tuesday. I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, thanks for tuning in and take care.